I'm Naisha McCauley, and you're watching AccessTV.org. Morning again. This is Jonathan Small, host of the producer of All About You. This morning is May the 13th, 2013. This program is broadcast every Monday morning live from AccessTV.org studios in downtown Hartford. And this show is designed to give the guests his or her life story. Occasionally, every now and then, we will get into a special topic, which we are planning to do uh, this morning. Uh, my guest is a very high profile political. Uh, leader uh, in the state of uh, Connecticut, has a long political background, and he's going to clarify some controversies and some issues regarding certain economic and political uh, development that's ongoing in our state. This morning, I have the chairman of the Metropolitan District Commission, Mr. William DeBella. Good morning, William. How you doing? Good morning, John. It's oh. my pleasure to be here. Okay, it's good to have you here, too. Could you just kind of let people know before we get into our topic, uh, who you are and where did you get your life started at? Um, well, I was born in Hartford uh, almost 70 years ago. Okay. Um, and uh, I was educated in Hartford. I was educated in the state of Connecticut. I uh, went to Bulkley High School, mm -hmm. um, graduated in Bulkley High School, uh, from Bulkley High School, and uh, went into went to Central Connecticut State University. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was Central Connecticut State College. Um, graduated from uh, Central Connecticut State College and uh, went in the Marine Corps during the Vietnamese. Uh, we, we didn't have much of a choice. Uh, came out, uh, got married, and uh, went into politics uh, okay. by virtue of went on city council. I think I was 23 or so, 24 years old when I went on city council. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the city council, I went uh, on to the state legislature, uh, state senate, and um, retired in 1996. Okay. So, um, I've been active on the Metropolitan District Commission since 1975 when I was on the city council. Uh, John Bailey passed away, who was a Democratic state and national chairman, and uh, I filled his appointment uh, in 1975. I became chairman in 1977. Uh, I was went in the legislature in 1980, and uh, was not reappointed by Mr. Ludkin because I didn't support him for mayor that year. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was 1981, and then went back on the board. I believe it was in '84, and oh. I've been on the board since 1984. So that's basically my my background. Uh, in terms of uh, my political background, in terms of what I did, so uh, that's where I am. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you said I can call you Billy one time off of the air, so Any, that's all right. Time you want. <laughs> okay, uh, let's clarify the difference between economic development and political empowerment. I guess the position that you have as a chairman of the Metropolitan District Commission is that a non-paying or paying on position? It is a non-paying. Uh, we get no money. Uh, we get no benefits. We get no expenses. Mm -hmm. uh, it is totally a voluntary uh, appointment, uh, and uh, that's what it is. Well, what type of criteria does it require us to have that position as a chairman of the Metropolitan District Commission? The criteria is that you're elected by your colleagues. There's mm -hmm. 29 members on the Metropolitan District Board. Um, and uh, they elect the chairman every two years. Mm -hmm. But I mean, what does the chairman supposed to do throughout the week? Well, what the chairman does is basically, I don't have any uh, executive uh, responsibilities. In other words, I don't manage people. Mm -hmm. I don't. Uh, all I do is I chair the board that establishes a policy. Mm -hmm. uh, the twenty-nine member board establishes a policy. Uh, that the Metropolitan District runs by. We adopt the budgets, um, we uh, hire the senior people, 
uh, and I mean real senior people, the board uh, has to approve the manager, the deputy managers, the chief engineer, uh, I believe the chief financial officer, they all serve uh, t at the uh, will of the board, mm -hmm. uh, those people. Um, and uh, we basically provide the policy that the district is run by um, and uh, maintain the compliance with the rules, regulations, and the laws of the state and federal government. Mm -hmm. Well, the Metropolitan District Commission is a municipal government. Technically, it's a municipal government. It was established by a special act of the state legislature in 1929, mm -hmm. um, and they have certain authorities. They have the authority to uh, control wastewater treatment, environmental uh, planning for the region, mm -hmm. uh, and obviously water, clean water, potable water, the uh, control, the uh, maintenance, the treatment, uh, the dissemination, um, and to protect the environmental uh, integrity of the almost 50,000 acres of land that we, uh, the um, Metropolitan District Com Com Commission controls. Mm -hmm. The positions of the employees that work for the Metropolitan uh, the, uh, District um, Commission, are those public sector jobs, city jobs, or um, government jobs? Those are public sector, well, they're city, they're, they're they're public sector jobs. Okay. They're, they have a union. Uh, they're uh, protected under union agreements, uh, mostly employees. We have some that are not uh, subject to union uh, union issue control. Mm -hmm. um, the Metropolitan District Commission, it represents eight different towns or, or cities? Eight, the eight towns. It represents, uh, it, it's composed of uh, Hartford, East Hartford, West Hartford, Newington, Wethersfield, Bloomfield, Rocky Hill, and uh, Windsor. Mm -hmm. uh, the Metropolitan District Commission, does they own land in Connecticut? We own 47,000 acres in Connecticut, okay. most of which is watershed lands mm -hmm. that uh, surround the reservoirs uh, in the north central part of the state up in Bar Camstead along the Farmington River. Mm -hmm. The Metropolitan District Commission also has their own police uh, department. We have a police department that uh, controls and, and uh, ensures uh, public safety on our 47,000 acres of, of land. They're sworn officers uh, trained by uh, the state. they trained, I believe, by the state police in terms of being licensed uh, by the state of Connecticut mm -hmm. as law enforcement uh, officers. Okay. The main requirements of the Metropolitan District Guard Commission is basically what? To serve the water and sewage throughout the areas that it represents? So does it have more requirements than, than that? No, that's basically what we do. Water and sewer and uh, economic, not economic, uh, planning, uh, environmental planning mm -hmm. that we have, regional planning. Uh, for about 30 years, we were uh, we were in a partnership with uh, CRRA, uh, and we ran the uh, facility in the South Meadows uh, that processed about 850,000 uh, metric uh, tons of garbage every year. Uh, we lost that contract two years ago, and uh, are still have some. Uh, open issues with the Connecticut Resource Recovery Authority, namely a $70 million loss of an arbitration that we have that's going on right now. It's been going on for four years. Mm -hmm. Has the Metropolitan District Commission always had, <clears throat> excuse me, a board of um, commissioners and our chairman since the beginning of this um, since establishment? 19, since 1929. Oh, okay. Uh, a lot of people would say is the Metropolitan District Commission as commissioners, uh, do they have any political influence on what goes on directly in the regions that they uh, represent? Uh, I, are you talking individual commissioners? I'm talking individual uh, commissioners. Do they have any so-called political influence? I mean... Um, I, I don't think so. I don't think there's major political influence that they have. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, they basically, uh, their, their responsibility is uh, for the water and in sewer operation, clean water uh, and uh, potable water and uh, wastewater. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, uh, we we deal with all the towns. 
uh, we have a major engineering influence in the region because that's basically what we are. We're an engineering and in public works uh, agency. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, uh, I don't know what kind of political influence you're talking about. Uh, other than uh, in their own communities, some of them, most of the people do because they're appointed either by their community, mm -hmm. by the governor, or they're appointed by uh, the legislature. So they're, they're, they have to have some political. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if we call it influence, they mm -hmm. have uh, rec political recognition. Well, I'm going to get into politics because politics plays a critical role in our society. Uh -huh. um, there's no doubt about it, you know, and political influence can be labeled, you do something for me, I do something for you, uh, you support my campaign, you support my party, I'll support you in other areas. Mm -hmm. and. People have the misconception that a chairman has a very powerful position, a position that you held right now as a chairman of the Metropolitan District of Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a long uh, political background that goes back into the 70s. So you kind of understand politics. Uh, does that help you as a chairman of the Metropolitan District um, Commission? I, I really don't think there's a lot of politics. I think it's basically uh, you have a... a the confidence of the people that serve. There's 29 members on that board. Okay, uh, it's it's not an easy uh, process, and and there is politics in it in the sense that politics is is relationships between people, and each community has their own interests. So mm -hmm. yes, those people that come there are politically sensitive mm -hmm. to the issues that their own community would have relative to the total metropolitan district commission. Sure. These, most people have had uh, extensive experience in politics over the years. We've had former mayors, we have uh, you know, former council people, former legislators uh, that serve on that board. So yeah, most of those people are, are politically uh, astute, if you want to put it that way. Uh, mm -hmm. They understand the, the theory of politics, and that is you've got to build a consensus. Mm -hmm. Whether in the United States Congress, the United States Senate, the House of Representatives, or the state senate, you have to be able to build a consensus. That's what politics is. Mm. And uh, if you can't build a consensus, you have chaos. And, or I shouldn't say chaos, you have difficulties. The uh, United States Congress is a perfect example of, of, of that. The inability to be able to work together to build a consensus, that's what a democracy is about. Mm -hmm. A democracy has to have consensus, and you build consensus through political understandings and agreements uh, that hopefully are in the best interest of uh, the total population that you represent. Okay. I mean, that's been an issue that I've dealt with my whole life. Uh, um, you know, I've been part of leadership in the Hartford City Council when I was there, in the State Senate when I was there, and obviously in the MDC. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a process of building a consensus on issues to make policy for in this case, the Metropolitan District Commission. Well, first of all, the main priority for the Metropolitan District Commission is to serve the water and sewage. Uh, I don't want to get into just having people assume that there's other factors that is more important than that. I mean, having the proper clean water, and I would say the Metropolitan District Commission has some of the best water in the country if it's really being examined. Um, I would agree with you. Yes. Obviously, that is good to know that our water systems is very uh, purified, clean, safe, and it's available to the people. Um, do the residents who have the uh, Metropolitan District Water Commission service to them, do they pay a certain tax on their... They, they pay a fee for their water. Okay. It's just like everything else. Uh, the water is treated as a user charge. In other words, it, the amount of water you use is metered mm -hmm. and you pay a specific fixed rate for that metered water and everybody pays that. It's different than the sewer side. The water side is it's it, you aren't exempt because of you're exempt from taxation. Uh, you're not. You buy water whether you're the state of Connecticut, the federal government, uh, a tax exempt institution, the city of Hartford, everybody pays for water. Mm -hmm. On the sewer side, it's different. That's an ad valorem charge. That gets paid out of your property taxes. Okay. So there's a formula, 
and I believe the city of Hartford pays about 32.7% of the total amount of the sewer costs. Mm -hmm. That comes out of the, the tax base, so it's paid for out of the property tax. Different than the water side, it's paid for out of the, it's a commodity that you purchase and you use it. Now, some places in the country, uh, and most places in the country, also have a sewer user charge, mm -hmm. which they apply it to the to to the sewer use um, charge, and in, instead of paying it out of the property tax, mm -hmm. we've maintained in this area this the issue of um, avalorum tax because it provides the basic user of the sewer system a, a benefit for residential customers uh, because of the large commercial uh, tax base, uh -huh. especially Hartford. Hartford has probably the biggest advantage. If you look at what you pay per resident, Hartford has the, the lowest cost for the sewer charge that's paid for out of the property tax because it has the largest commercial base of users. Uh -huh. The larger the commercial base of users you have, in, in the sewer side, the less the, the resident pays, the more gets shifted to commercial. Hartford has about 83% of our base is commercial and about 17 is residential. Mm -hmm. So it's a big advantage for Hartford to, and, and this was changed back in 19, I think it was 1978, and we were allowed to be exempt from the sewer user charge and we have sort of what you call the hybrid, a, a mixed use, uh, which has been beneficial and every time we study it we find that the residential user comes out better under the Avalorum system rather than the straight user charge. Mm -hmm. And then the main thing is it's not the MDC just is not represented by Hartford alone. There's still eight other cities and towns that have the same services that Hartford residents has. The, the Metropolitan District Commission Board is made up of 29 members. Mm -hmm. About 32 percent of that representation is from Hartford. Mm -hmm. The other uh, the other base, uh, two-thirds, is, is the suburban towns. Mm -hmm. It's just actually, excuse me, the headquarters building is located in downtown Hartford. Yes, it is. Okay. And your big sewer treatment plants is located in more than one place, but I know you have a big one in the South Meadows. That That's the largest one. We are spending about $380 million upgrading that system. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's where it, it's been located, and it's been located there since uh, 1929, somewhere before that, actually. Um, and uh, that's the largest uh, provider. Right now, its uh, capacity is about 60, 62 to 65 million gallons a day we process there. It's going to be expanded to about 225 uh, million gallons a day, mm -hmm. uh, a substantial increase. In the, it's being updated uh, for several other environmental compliant regulations uh, to, so that the Long Island Sound is maintained uh, and we don't have to discharge into the Long Island Sound of certain, uh, certain commodities that come out of that system. Mm -hmm. Well, you said something very important that is constantly being upgraded because I guess with the amount of sewage that can consist in our society, it's very important that it's monitored properly and always efficient. Well, the biggest upgrade is the nitrogen, the nitrates. The nitrogen gets discharged into the Connecticut River, which goes down into Long Island Sound and is having major negative impacts on, on our fish life, on the fish life, lobsters and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Uh, as well as the habitat along the Connecticut River. Uh, the federal government has dictated and mandated that uh, the nitrates be uh, excluded from, from, the, from the process. We have to treat the nitrates separately. And uh, nitrates uh, are very expensive to take the nitrate discharge out of, out of the sewage, uh, the waste sewage. Uh, that's one of the issues. The second issue is the separation of the sewers themselves. Mm -hmm. Hartford has a single sewer basis. The suburbs have water for, for storm sewers and waste are in two different sewers. What we're doing is in Hartford we're separating that system mm -hmm. because what you have had for years is when you, you have rainstorms, you have an inundation of the su single sewer and it backs up. 
or its surcharges into homes if you don't have a backflow uh, and you have something in your basement you'll flood your basement and as a result uh, we are uh, rectifying that that process and uh, hopefully uh, and, and the number of surcharges have dropped dramatically and what it does is it's providing uh, a, a split system in Hartford which will a, a big cost of that now that's changed how we've decided from an engineering standpoint on how to how to uh, change that now normally what would have happened is that you would dig up a street you dig a trench down the other side of the street to put the second sewer in uh, and we're doing that in many parts of the city that's what they call mm -hmm. a sewer separation program mm -hmm. um, however um, we have found that tunneling uh, has been a lot more efficient a lot cheaper to do it that way and it uh, doesn't hinder the economic development in a city or a town especially Hartford mm -hmm. and that is when you dig a street up there's no simple way of digging a trench down the middle of the street mm -hmm. creates disruption uh, to the business people to the residential people yes. and we've looked at several options of, of as we've been into this now six or seven years into this process of doing the looked at doing work at, in the evening the problem is or at night mm -hmm. the problem is at night uh, people have to sleep right. <laughs> to no, go to work that's, that's and when true. you start to look at that as an option that's not an option uh -huh. uh, uh, we we spend an enormous amount of money on police and we only have police uh, on the streets we don't have non uh, police officers to control traffic uh, because some places do it with uh, what they call uh, people that just try to direct traffic and they're not mm -hmm. uh, sworn police officers we have not done that we have stayed which is more expensive but we feel that the uh, the value of the police officer is significantly greater than having someone that isn't with a uniform on doing it uh, one because it's people are more likely to heed a police officer than they are someone who's a has a, a sign up to tell them they, they have to stop mm -hmm. and it also it, it helps the presence of police officers in the community create safety within the community itself so that's always been something we've done now that being said uh, we continue to look at better ways of doing this and we're finding that the use of tunnels and deep tunneling is much much more because the process that we're building in the clean water project is major deep tunnels 230 feet below ground 28 to 30 feet in diameter that will carry the new will carry the waste and also serve as storage areas mm -hmm. when we have heavy rainstorms so we're using more and more tunneling the technology has gotten significantly better uh, it's much cheaper it's less disruptive and uh, it provides uh, more stability in the community in terms of disruption to the to the local residents well this sounds like to me you're getting into the clean water project that we was are. designed that's what it is about seven years ago and well it's been designed for about uh, 10 we started seven years ago doing most of it obviously what happened uh, it's a mandate by the federal government the mm -hmm. federal government has told us uh, that we had to do it Department of uh, not DEP Department of uh, Environmental Protection uh, on the federal level uh, and uh, in the state so we're under a federal mandate uh, to comply and we have a timetable and mm -hmm. we have uh, that we have to complete it within um, and uh, fortunately we're about uh, two years or so ahead of schedule and we're basically below budget which is a rather significant issue <laughs> given most public works projects when you look at what they did in Boston with the big dig mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it, it's 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 our primary focus is to complete this on time within budget uh, because we're spending people's money and that's our primary responsibility to be in conformity with the amount of money that we've asked the public for and in this case we've been fortunate enough uh, in the last seven years to be ahead of budget we just gone for our second uh, referendum uh, the first was an 800 million dollar uh, referendum and the second one that was last uh, November was for an additional 
eight hundred million dollars. Well, the total cost for this project is over two billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Number one, uh, that money again is coming from who? Who is actually paying that two plus million dollars for this project? Well, the two the two point two billion dollars is a combination of federal, state, and obviously uh, district. Uh, the district users. Mm -hmm. uh, if if you drink our water, uh, and you are in one of the eight district towns, there's a district. There's a surcharge on that water, mm -hmm. and that water funds the clean water project. Okay, so that that's where that comes from. But that money is being paid to MDC, and then MDC distributes the money towards different contractors or different uh, workers. To MDC's got the total responsibility within the compliance and within the regulations and rules set up by DEEP on mm -hmm. the state level and the federal government. We have received uh, a substantial amount of federal money. Um, I think last year we received somewhere in the area of 140 or $50 million dollars. Mm -hmm. towards this project. Um, <clears throat> some of that was energy money. We built a treatment, uh, we built a uh, power plant in the South Meadows that uh, provides us with most of our electricity. Um, it's a small uh, two and a half megawatt electric plant that the federal government provided us under the energy, uh, clean energy uh, legislation. Mm -hmm. um, we receive a 2% grant and aid from the state of Connecticut under the clean water uh, projects, the state legislature funds. And then uh, uh, obviously the rest of it's paid for out of the water, the water cost. We do is we have the total responsibility to design, to construct, to maintain, and to operate that sewer system. So mm -hmm. what we do is uh, we bid all of the work uh, on the construction of the project. Uh, in compliance with state and federal regulations and rules. Um, we have a federal acquisition system that we adopted three years ago so we could get federal money. Uh -huh. <coughs> and <coughs> we also have uh, state regulations and rules that DEEP uh -huh. established. Uh -huh. So that's the process. Let's take a question quick break maybe if you want to get a little water something to drink and we'll be back uh very shortly this is jonathan small hosting all about you and my special guest this morning is the chairman of the metropolitan district commission william debella and we'll be right back in a very short moment Thank you. How do you judge a law firm's success? Cases won, money made, or what the firm does in the community? At Dressler Strickland, we know that success is just the beginning. The true measure of success is what you do with it. For 33 years, we've used our success to help our neighbors and our community. 24-7, 11-22. Whenever you need us, we'll be there. Dressler Strickland, building communities one case at a time. Black History Month, we pause to acknowledge and appreciate contributions enriching our cultural and intellectual fabric. Keep it coming. We are the members of the Day Boston Dance Theater, and we celebrate Black History 365 days of the year. We read Van Coco Key. What time is it? Time to read! It's always time to read. Lake Education and Hartford Public Schools declare reading a team sport and award a fun soak celebration at Coco Key Water Resort to the school with the most books read. Your achievement level is displayed by Make Education Time to Read wristbands. Motivate, stimulate, educate. And Make Education makes it fun. Okay, 
again, this is Jonathan Small, hosting All About You. And this morning I have my guest, Chairman of the Metropolitan District Commission, William Adabella. And we've been talking many different issues related towards his position, the Metropolitan District Commission. Uh, I kind of want to get into the second half of this program, dealing with the economic side of this uh, municipal government. Uh, William, before we left, we kind of was talking a little bit about the Clean Water Project. But before we kind of get more in depth with that, I kind of want to just find out a few <clears throat> uh, information about the Metropolitan District um, Commission. First of all, how much in assets is the Metropolitan District Commission worth? Like a value, like if a baseball team like the New York Yankees could be valued over $1 billion. Is it a way to determine how much revenues or value that the Metropolitan District Commission consists of? Well, I, I guess if, <clears throat> if you were going to market it and sell it, that would be one value, and I, I, that would be a hard one to mm -hmm. to establish. But if you take 50, 47,000 acres of land, about uh, 12 to 14,000 of that is uh, actually commercial, or it could be commercial or residential. Mm -hmm. uh, has a significant value. The value of our watershed land is only good for watershed protection. Okay. So, I mean, you've got certain federal and state regulations and laws that restrict the use and what you can put on that. So that sort of drops the value of it. Mm -hmm. But I would think that the, the district is worth uh, four or five, three or four billion dollars, at least in terms of its infrastructure. Um, we're investing two point two billion dollars into it now. Mm -hmm. uh, but remember it's a depreciating asset. It, it, it continues to depreciate, not really appreciates because uh, we're using most of what we use, the water delivery system, the wastewater treatment delivery system, uh, it gets old and has to be replaced. So mm -hmm. there's a, a lot of depreciation in that. Uh, but um, you know its functionality is, is, uh, is excellent because we have uh, we maintain it so well, and and one of the things that the Metropolitan District Commission and the people that came before me, uh, Charles Goodwin, who was really the father of the Metropolitan District Commission, uh, started back at the turn of the century, talking about knowing that for any community to be successful economically, mm -hmm. it had to have a solid infrastructure base. That is, sewer and water. Without water, you don't have development. Yes. Um, I, I, we talked earlier. Connecticut has plentiful water. However, mm -hmm. it's not plentiful in all areas. Mm -hmm. A good example is the University of Connecticut. Its stores is having a major problem now on trying to, as they expand, to have enough water to expand. So uh, water is, is very critical to, to that development. And, when they did this, they did it around 1912 is when they really came up with the idea that you couldn't continue to take water out of a small reservoir if Hartford was going to grow and be a, a vibrant part of America as it was growing. Mm -hmm. And they developed what became a series of reservoirs up in the north central part, Bar Campstead area. And uh, they took two basic towns, closed them down, took everything out of them, and uh, created uh, an impoundment of these reservoirs. They're man-made. They aren't artificially, or they aren't, uh, they're artificial in terms of being man-made. Um, and they built that system. You could never do that today. You mm -hmm. could never take that much land, public land, and convert it into a reservoir system along the Farmington River. And if you look at the system, it w it's designed so that there's about, it's 200 degrees above sea level in downtown Hartford's about two degrees above sea level. So mm -hmm. the water is gravity. It runs downhill. Uh, it's a magnificent system that was designed. And uh, these people had great vision uh, to do this. But they also had even greater vision to realize that you had to make it independent of towns and cities because infrastructure seems to be the last thing the governments want to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And if you don't pay attention to infrastructure, you don't physically see it. So right. you don't see pipes deteriorating. You don't see uh, dams deteriorating. Uh, and 
many times you can say, well, we're not going to spend X number of dollars. What happens is you dissipate the value of that infrastructure, and ultimately you pay the price and you have to spend a lot of money. What the Metropolitan District Commission has done well is it's maintained its physical, its physical capacity. Uh, we talked about the Clean Water Project. Mm -hmm. Have we done this back when I started pushing for it in 1975, 1978? I think the the cost then was somewhere in the area between 250 and 300 thousand dollars, 300 million. Mm -hmm. million okay. Uh, look at what we're talking about now. We're talking 2.2 billion dollars. So. Once you get this, in, 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 and we will have a pristine system, uh, we'll also spend over that period of time probably another $2 billion on the water side. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be spent somewhere in the year two to three to $4 billion to make sure that that system is maintained and it, it's, it's efficient. Because what you're doing is you are transferring to the next generation and generations after us mm -hmm. a system that is going to be uh, a system that people can live with and can live by and, and can attract people into this region. Mm. And water is a critical component of economic development. So hopefully uh, 25 years from now mm. we've finished this system and uh, we've paid for it uh, because uh, it's, but it will we'll need to be uh, will have to be concerned with uh, maintaining it and, and maintaining it. And that's why the Metropolitan District has been successful, because we don't divert money to social services, to, to educational issues and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, been one of the values of having this type of an organization, uh, that they pay attention to one thing, that's infrastructure and the delivery of two major services. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to be fair enough to give you ample enough time to give a complete explanation on the requirements and what the Metropolitan District Commission is consisting of. And I hope I gave you some ample time to really explain it oh, as, as best as you can. Yeah. Uh, but I do want to get into a little bit of a controversy issue about sure. this clean water project. I guess when this project got started, maybe 2007 directly, uh, and it, I know this project goes outside of Hartford, but a lot of the grassroots agencies, because Hartford has a high unemployment rate in the city, and many people in the, in the city thought that this project, when they hear $2.2 billion, they hear job growth, job development, the need to put people to work to fix this project or change this project. There was this assumption that there would be a lot of hiring of people, contractors, city residents, uh, black and Latino people. And MDC has had uh, the African-American Alliance protests in front of its headquarters. You've had meetings with the African-American um, Alliance. Oh, yeah. And they feel like they're basically being shut out of this billion dollar project. Now, is that true or valid or is it more to this? than what they're saying. Uh, again, we don't believe they are. I mean, again, what we've done is we comply with state and federal regulations in terms of, of who can work on it. One of the problems is if we did this job 20 years ago, mm -hmm. there'd probably be eight to 10,000 10, 10, people working on it, seven, 8,000 people. We will never have more than 2,000 people working on this project at any one time. Um, and that's because the whole context of, of construction and it has changed dramatically. Picks and shovels, you don't do construction that way. You use massive uh, 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 land movers and, and payloaders and things of that nature that are all automated. Um, like I said, we're not, the vast majority of what we're doing, we're doing in tunneling, mm -hmm. which we would have 20 years ago, 25 years ago, had to dig big trenches to run these, these deep sewers. Uh, would have required an enormous amount of manpower that isn't required. Same way when we build highways mm -hmm. and, and, and roads and things of that nature. The technology of construction has dramatically changed. The engineering capacities have dramatically changed. Um, we are still providing a, a substantial number of employ employable jobs in the region through the construction we do. 
not only the construction, the trucking, all the other things that are ancillary to trucking. Uh, and, and we have a compliant responsibility for small business. We have a small business uh, organization that, or, or process that's running almost 70% uh, minority hiring. Mm -hmm. And remember, minority is not just Afri African American and Latino, it's also women. So uh, we, we comply with all those requirements. We have far exceed the state's uh, requirements that they have in terms of, uh, of, of minority hiring. We've commissioned a, 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 a diversity study, a capacity study. We complied with all the responsibilities. Another issue, uh, CHRO, uh, we, we are subject to CHRO. The only municipal agency in the state of Connecticut that has to comply with the state's C CHRO was the state agency that controls mm -hmm. affirmative action and diversity hiring. And uh, this last year, we were first year we were in, in that process. I believe there were 17 state agencies that were considered in the first round, and only two of them passed on their affirmative action policy, and MDC was one of them. So we have complied with the state regulations, the federal regulations, um, and we have, uh, we believe, uh, the strongest in the state, the strongest uh, diversity and affirmative action program, and we comply with that. We far and exceed the state requirement uh, of, of affirmative action. This program is running almost 40% minority uh, contractors. So it's not that we aren't hiring minority contractors. They're, we don't hire them. Mm -hmm. They bid the project. They bid for the process. And, and we've dramatically re relaxed questions like bonding. Uh, we, we work with our, we spend almost $600,000 on affirmative action uh, components and, and employees to make people comply and make sure they comply with the regulations and rules. Uh, something that we weren't doing seven years ago in terms of the size of our affirmative action organization within MDC. Um, and again, we have, we have worked with the congressman, we have worked with city council. Um, some of the regulations, most of the regulations, we don't establish regulations. Mm -hmm. They are established by the legislature or the United States Congress. What we do is live within the confines of DEEP, who provides us with most of our money. Okay. Now, there's been moves we've been part of. We've said we'll, we'll comply with whatever the rules are. And uh, again, I think that uh, if, you, if, if people want to be uh, fair and look at what we've done, um, it's, it's, it's been significant uh, in terms of uh, MDC. Is everybody happy with it? No. I mean, yeah. there's no doubt about it. You're never going to have a situation where everybody's happy. But if you look at the basic attitude that the people of this region have about MDC, in, in, in this last, in this last um, referendum, uh, we were very concerned, and part of that referendum, we did uh, a, a substantial amount of polling relative to what MDC's uh, position was in terms of this eight-member district towns. Mm -hmm. And it was significantly high, almost up to the 85 and 90 percent satisfaction uh, basis. And, and remember, we've been increasing the cost of water because we've got to pay for this clean water project. So uh, when you get a 77 percent uh, positive vote on a referendum, that's significant. I can't think of too many referendums in my political time that received 77 percent support from the, the community, especially in an economic time that we have right now. Our economic conditions, as you know, aren't sterling. Mm -hmm. And uh, to receive a 77% favorable support for a referendum is significant. Well, I don't dispute the fact of the 77% that voted for it. I think you mentioned something a little while earlier that this project has the capacity to employ about 2,000 people. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that <clears throat> when you say minorities, it's not just black and Latinos, it's women as, as well. If you had a ratio now when you're saying how many minorities are benefiting or directly on this project, um, excluding women, 
let's just say black and Latino and other minorities, is that number still going to be high or is that number now going to be low? It's going to be very high. Compared to the state, it's significantly higher than anything the state's done. Okay. Okay. I mean, I'll give you the numbers. I don't have any problem. I don't have them at yeah, I mean, but the best is you, is you uh, can. We, 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 like I said, CHRO, we are the only uh -huh. municipality in the state that has, has responsibility to have our affirmative action program approved by CHRO. Uh -huh. There is no other. <clears throat> the state agencies are having trouble meeting. We had no problem. We passed first right out of the box, first shot. So, I mean, I think it says something for what we do and what our we feel our responsibility is to uh, diversity. We have our own diversity committee, which we didn't have uh -huh. up until about six, seven, eight years ago. We created the, our, the diversity committee. Uh -huh. We did a diversity study, a capacity study to be in compliance with the courts uh, in terms of being able to defend our diversity uh -huh. uh, program. Um, and that's significant because, as you well know, uh, jobs and competition for jobs is very, very difficult in this economy. I agree with that. And uh, as a result, we wanted to make sure that we, because we did have an aggressive uh, diversity program and an aggressive uh, affirmative action program, that we could defend that in the event that people brought an action against us because we were violating and we had to go out and spend, we spent well over two and a half million dollars mm -hmm. to establish the diversity study, the capacity study, and to continue to up update those things. So uh, we we feel, and this board does, that uh, we have a commitment and an obligation and, and we're living by that. Uh, you don't make everybody happy in this mm -hmm. world, unfortunately. Um, and there are people that disagree uh, with that, um, but I don't believe they're in the vast, vast majority or even the vast majority of the minority uh, in terms of uh, I'm not talking minorities. I'm talking about numbers. Numbers, okay. Um, so um, again, we, we've we've met with uh, all those people. Um, we we uh, continue to meet with them. We mm -hmm. continue to meet with the with the congressmen, the business people. We had a a, dis, a problem um, on Albany Avenue in in terms of how we were going to separate the sewers up there mm -hmm. because it was truly having a disruptive situation when you have concentration of business and to rip up a road or dig a trench down the middle of a road, you are going to create, there's no way you can avoid creating disruption. Mm -hmm. We aren't going to do that up there. If you look at Albany Avenue, anybody looks at Al Albany Avenue, you're going to see because of the density of, of, of development up there, the number of stores and, and, and business uh, outlets that they have, to do that would create chaos up there, and we're going to do it through a tunneling process. Mm -hmm. It won't be on the surface disrupting traffic and in commerce and in people's lives, and not just commerce, but people in terms of coming and going as residential users. So mm -hmm. we we have continued to refine uh, what we do at the MDC, and um, you know, do we are we always right? No, no one's always right. Yes. Are we criticized? When we're criticized, we're open to the criticism, and we try to rectify that criticism. And I think that's the history that we're trying to project, and that's what the 29-member district board uh, tries to do by implementing a policy that makes economic sense, uh, that makes uh, sense to the general population, and uh, provides great uh, service in terms of water and sewer. Well, William, I know you mentioned a few times that MDC is not solely responsible for how this project is being distributed, and I can understand that part. Um, I've had Rufus Wells, who works with a lot of minority contractors. Um, he's told me that, I guess, in the past in Atlanta, when they was redeveloping the airport, uh, I think it was the early 80s, that that project created some black millionaires. And Atlanta has a very high percentage of black people that live in the city, just like Hartford has a black and a Latino base. First of all, has this project uh, created any millionaires? I think Pagnelli has made a lot of money in the millions on this project. Is that accurate or not accurate? I don't know how accurate that is. I don't know how much work Pagnelli's done. I don't know how much work Manafort's done. Manafort, I'll tell you. And, and, and it's not my concern how many millionaires we make. Our responsibility is to create 
a system that's fair mm -hmm. and is put out to bid. And that that's what the purpose of what we're doing is. Okay. I mean, we, we aren't supposed to be saying, well, I'm, I'm going to choose who I'm going to make a millionaire. Mm -hmm. A millionaire or however they, they arrive at a financial reward uh, is based on what they put in for a bid to get work from us. Okay. We go to the lowest qualified bidder. Uh -huh. And and I don't know who's <laughs> what Rufus Wells terms as making millionaires. That's not our intention. That's not our, our charge. It's not our responsibility. Uh -huh. Our responsibility is we're a public a public uh, agency and that we have to provide. I mean, someone should ask the state of Connecticut. They spend <laughs> more money than we do. Hey. And how many millionaires they create? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure they'd be able to tell you. Yeah, but that's not our responsibility in life to create millionaires. Our responsibility is to provide a product to the public that says reasonable and is is fair and is beneficial mm -hmm. to the public. For every dollar we spend, we expect to get a return on that dollar that is at the highest return for the taxpayers and for the water users in our in our area. Well, you know, if the bidding process is out there and it's equally the whoever comes in with the lowest bid and they're able to successfully get the contract, then I think that's part of having a fairness uh, system. Now, like I say, I haven't met with these um, grassroots agencies like the African American um, Alliance. I, like I said, I've had Rufus Wells on my show. I've talked to him on the phone, but I don't speak to him enough to really understand exactly the ins and outs. I just think that when people see a major development project, they feel that they should be getting a lot out of it, or at least getting more than what they're getting. And you say you can't make everybody happy on this particular project. But what people perceive is what they should get out of it isn't always the reality of what how, how it gets done. It's got to be done in compliance. We, we don't set the rules. Okay. MDC complies with the rules. We don't, in other words, what we do is we have to comply with DEEP, the state, the federal government, the Department of Health. All, they all have regulations and rules. Mm -hmm. We have to comply with the bidding processes of the federal government, of the state government. And, and, and we're, it's, it's a very difficult process to do that. Mm -hmm. We have to be concerned with our bond rate in terms of how much it costs us to raise money. Mm -hmm. And our bond rating is a it's double A uh, plus, which is probably one of the highest in the in the region for the amount of work we're doing. Mm -hmm. So those are all parts of the things that part of the thing that this district board has a responsibility to comply with. And if we're out of compliance, we will be heavily fined. And if we're heavily fined, that means the water users and the taxpayers are going to pay a substantial amount of money. That's our job. That's mm -hmm. our responsibility. That's our mission. And we try to do that in the best way possible to ensure that we create as many jobs as we can for our local people. And, and again, we don't have the luxury to be able to, to make restrictions on local people mm -hmm. or, or restricting out-of-state people. The federal government doesn't mm -hmm. allow us to do those things. Mm -hmm. and, and, and anybody that makes that representation, it's just like state of Connecticut. Take the state of Connecticut on the highway bid. You go, you'll see out-of-state contractors doing work in the state of Connecticut. All right. And, and that's a function of, of, of a bidding process. Now, obviously, uh, even when you have an out-of-state company, they're using local people. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense that you get a, someone from New Jersey. They're not bringing people from New Jersey to do the vast majority of the work. We work with those contractors. We encourage them to hire local residents. We have two people that work with contractors. We put bids out. We break up bids into smaller packages so that we can get local contractors that can bid successfully those. We deal with the main contractor to make sure that he's using local people for trucking, for things that are definitely local. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we've got all the numbers on that. We have to have compliance from the state and federal government on how much people get paid and we have to be able to go out on that site and check that they're being paid and who the people are and we have all that information. So, I mean, we, we comply with the federal and state governments. We're very meticulous relative to those responsibilities and 
All I can say is that uh, this has been a very difficult project, mm -hmm. and we have done it far within the constraints of our our economic the, the economic demands. Like I said, we're a couple of years ahead on this project, and we are also uh, ahead financially uh, on it to, in terms of spending money. The worst thing we could be is in excess of what the public right. expected for it to be spent. Because remember, it, people don't want to deal with this issue, but mm. we have a responsibility to spend this money as efficiently and effectively as possible. It's not our money. It's not the MDC's money. It's not. This is other people's money. And we have a great obligation here. And we, in this district board, has been very, very clear. All 29 members. Look at the votes on the board. Mm -hmm. The votes on the board are almost unanimous on everything we do. Almost unanimous yes. on everything we do, if you look at it. Which means we have built a consensus of opinion there. And I believe it's been a fair opinion. And uh, we have tried to benefit everybody involved. But you don't always make everybody happy. And, you know, well, I you, can't make millionaires. I understand that part. You're saying it's not MDC's money, but doesn't MDC still get access to the money out of that? That $2.2 billion, doesn't some of that money still go through the hands of MDC, part of that $2.2 billion? You know, it all goes through our hands. Okay. What, what I'm saying is we have an obligation mm -hmm. to make sure it's as efficiently and effectively done in compliance okay. with all the rules. Mm -hmm. it, it, we don't set the rules. <laughs> that's, that's the, see, that's the unfortunate thing we have here. Everybody thinks that MDC is setting these rules. Right. The rules are set by someone else. Okay. All we do is we implement them based on that. We aren't a legislative body. Mm -hmm. We don't. We, in other words, we have policies. We have c comply with what the federal and state government say we have to comply with, and plus what we've told the financial markets and everybody else. Mm -hmm. We have very serious responsibility here, and uh, you know, I've got twenty-eight other commissioners that sit in that board, and none of those people are going to jeopardize their reputations, their their financial capacity or anything else in terms of not paying attention to the rules. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a very responsible um, position that MDC has uh, with this project. There should be no misconception about that part. Um, you did mention that this project has the capacity to employ about 2,000 people. Is that where we're at now? Is that where we could be at? I'm, I'm saying it, they'll never exceed that. Okay. Uh, sometimes we'll be at 1,100, 1,200. It depends on, on, on you know where we are in the project, whether we're doing vertical or whether we're doing horizontal uh, construction. Um, again, that's what our people have told us, that we will never exceed that number. Okay. Now, had we, been, if we had done this... 15 years ago, the mm -hmm. number would have been substantially above 2,000. Mm -hmm. um, it's technology. It's, to, it's the same problem that we find in our general economy, mm -hmm. that we find people unable to be able to be employed because of the change of technology, automation, um, robotics, everything else that we use that people are being substituted with. And uh, I can remember long time ago sitting in college and, and saying listen to my professor economics professor saying that you he says he would not see it but I probably would uh, and that is that we would pay people not to work yes but think about it mm -hmm. I mean the, the machines and automation do so many things and do it so efficiently it, it creates a dislocation within our economic uh, our, our economic base. It, uh -huh. It's happening in our society now with the unemployment rates that mm -hmm. we have. Um, but again, you know, it's like everything else. You've got to work at trying to make that better. And, and, and we, hopefully, MDC does do that. And mm -hmm. I think we've got a responsibility to our community, uh, to uh, the people within our community, and to provide as much employment as possible. But we are not job trainers. Mm -hmm. We train our own people, yes. but for us to go out, and one of the objections was from some of the segments of our community that we should be in a training mode. We should be training people, and we, we don't have that skill. Okay, That's the Department of Labor. That's people at universities and colleges and schools and trade schools that do that. MDC doesn't do that, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's bad economic utilization of our money. 
we don't have that capacity, and, mm-hmm. we, and we and we we understand that, and, mm-hmm. and I think most people realize that too. Well, we can probably go into so many different areas. Maybe it should have just been a better training system set aside uh, that really trains people for the jobs that is required on this project. But and not by us. No, not by us, but by some source. Someone uh, should have. I agree. I agree. But again, you you got to understand there are large training groups. There's plenty of people that. The job funnel. We work very closely with the job funnel. You mentioned that before. But they don't get the jobs many times when they go through the job funnel. They find themselves still looking for a job because there's really no direct link or no direct collaboration to well, the we, company's we, hiring. Well, I, I again, you know more about that. I know we okay. have dealt with the with the uh, job funnel mm-hmm. in terms of when we tried to create a, a training program, it wasn't as, it wasn't as efficient as it could have been done. By another agency, mm-hmm. and and it, we ended up put. We didn't do it. It was put out to a bid. Remember when we did it? Okay. Went out. But anyway, listen. Um, we do. We do. Our responsibility is is fairly simple. Mm-hmm. We've got a responsibility to get this job done within budget, on time, and in compliance with the rules and regulations. And and along the way, obviously, we try to create as much economy and as much enterprise locally as we possibly can. That's why we have the small business program. That, okay. That, that well, I, I'm sorry, but we're out of time. And it was fair enough for you to at least to come down this morning and explain to the internet audience out here exactly about the pros and cons and the requirements of this project. And I appreciate you, William DeBella, coming down, being a guest this morning. Again, this is Jonathan Small, host of All About You. I enjoyed doing this program uh, this morning. And as I say every week, everybody out there, have a very blessed day and keep the faith. Thank you.